Hello, everyone. Uh, today, I am extremely excited to introduce uh, Professor Michael Batty to our fall NYU uh, CUSP seminar. Professor Batty is the Bartlett Professor in University College London and the Chair of the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis. Um, the accolades are more, so I will mention only a few in the interest of time, because that would take, I rehearsed it, it would take probably around six minutes. Uh, he's the author of numerous books, including the award-winning Cities and Complexity and the New Science of Cities. In his most latest book, Inventing Future Cities, uh, published in 20, 2018 by MIT Press, he offers valuable insights for eminent urban challenges. Professor Buddy is a pioneer of computational methods for urban planning and has been designing decision support decision support methods and frameworks for almost 50 years. Uh, the, the, and the topic today covers uh, novel challenges. He's the recipient of the Founders Medal of the Royal Geographical Society, um, the Gold Medal of the Royal Town Planning Institute in 2016, and the Senior Scholar Award of the Complex System Society in 2016. We are glad to have you with us today, Professor Batty, and hear about complexity, models, and digital twins in urban planning. Let's give a warm round of virtual applause to our speaker. You can go ahead. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, thanks for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, let me tell you a little bit about, um, uh, about what I'm gonna to say to begin with, but, but I first should say that um, I'm no stranger to CUSP. In fact, in the very early days of CUSP, 2013 or 2014, I think, I spent a couple of weeks um, uh, in CUSP, uh, uh, living in Brooklyn um, in the very early days, basically. And uh, there are a few people still left from those days, basically. Um, and in fact, two years ago, uh, just before the pandemic broke, I was in New York City. I gave a talk at Columbia, in fact, the talk of Columbia, and I probably apologize uh, uh, because there are one or two uh, items in this talk, which were which were given a couple of years ago when I was at Columbia, um, and I also visited uh, um, <coughs> I visited Cusp then basically and met the director uh, and uh, Paul Torrens, who is one of my ex PhD students, who is a professor in um, computer science, I think, uh, in in NYU. Okay, well, without more ado, let me tell you a little bit about what I'm going to talk about. This is a fairly general talk. It's not technical in any sense. It poses a whole variety of ideas, and I've entitled it Complexity Models and Digital Twins. Uh, and the term digital twin is very uh, hot at the present time. Many people are talking about models as being twins of real systems in some sense, and that raises a whole uh, range of conundrums uh, and ambiguities. Um, you can actually get the, get the talk, you can get the PDF from uh, that link, and there's the tiny URL, 2P8F8ERM, and I'll give you that at the end, basically, but you can get the talk uh, as a PDF um, uh, now or indeed uh, after, the, uh, after, after the talk. Okay, so let me tell you what I'm going to talk about. Okay, I'm going to begin with a few comments about complexity in urban planning, just to set some focus, because... Uh, in the last 20 years, there's been a sea change, probably the last 30 or 40 years, there's been a sea change from top down to bottom up in some senses, that the, the, the strong metaphors and analogies in our field are no longer machines, they're more like organisms. So cities are seen as being evolving systems in that sense. And complexity science is based on that, that cities are increasing in complexity uh, all the time. And this changes the theories and our approaches in some sense, the very existence of the idea of many models uh, of the same phenomenon, which I'll, I'll, I'll move on to, the idea of many digital twins really is based on this notion that cities are becoming ever more complex. We have many, many uh, different theories that try and describe them in certain ways. Uh, and in this particular context, we're to some extent uh, running to stand still really. Many of our theories date very quickly and uh, the more people uh, who think about cities, the more theories there seem to be. So I'll talk a little bit about many models of the same phenomenon. And that leads me on to this third topic of digital twins. What are they and where did, where did they come from? And how close to the real thing is a digital twin? Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, 
uh, some background about where the ideas came from. And then I'll digress slightly and tell you some stories about maps as analogies. Maps are excellent examples of digital twins because we can actually make maps that get closer uh, to the real thing. And there are lots of people over many years who've talked about the notion of how accurate is the map or how close the map is to the real thing. Uh, and at that point, I'll have given enough preamble, that will take me about sort of 25, 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes, uh, and then I'll actually look at four different types of digital twin, um, four different types of model of the same place. I'm going to begin by talking and just showing you some examples of VR and AR, that's virtual reality and augmented reality, 3D city models, which uh, 20 years ago were uh, relatively new in some senses, but now are very commonplace, really. There are lots and lots of 3D city models, but they are very evocative. Many people outside of our field, when we talk about models, they think of 3D cities as being uh, models in that sense. It harks back to the old idea of the architectural model. And then I'll talk about smart buildings. To some extent, the, the best example in our field uh, in terms of a digital twin is a building information uh, model or building information management system, a BIM in some sense, which really uh, relate to the development of um, a model of a building that uh, not only enables you to design the building, but also once it's constructed to uh, use the related software or the same software to actually maintain the building, to actually service it. And in that sense, the, the models are a lot closer to the real thing uh, than in the context of the other models I'll talk about. I'll move then on to looking at real-time simulation, uh, transit, passenger demand, trains, supply and flows. And I'll use the example of, of uh, London, basically, uh, and the models that we've been building of, uh, of the flow of activity uh, in the city, in a sense, which, again, are digital twins of some sort and are, can be quite close to the real thing. Uh, in terms of latency between when we get the data and uh, and how we build models and actually use models to actually enable control. And last but not least, I'll talk about long-term urban change. My four models here, my four digital twins, all relate in some sense to the same place, but they're at different scales. And that place is in East London. My, my example will be uh, in East London at the Olympic Park, basically. So the BIM that we have, in fact, is a building on the Olympic Park, which was the old media center. Uh, and the other models all, in fact, uh, are broader than that in some sense, but they cover that particular area. So the, the, the big, uh, the big uh, paradox in all of this is that if we have four different models, uh, different perspectives on the same place. Uh, and the implication is that we can have many, many more than four in this particular context. How do we deal with them? How do we relate them? How do we integrate them in some sense? So in that context, this is the, the sort of big question mark that is posed really by the idea of many models, uh, many digital twins in that sense. Okay, so let me say a few words about complexity in urban planning. I actually said that um, uh, there had been this switch really to some extent in uh, the philosophy of urban planning from the mid 20th century to the early 21st century and that is a shift really from what one might call the systems approach where um, it was assumed that cities could be organized from the top down they were managed and controlled and they grew and evolved really from the top down in this particular context and that model was found to be wanting in many ways uh, and it evolved, if you like, into uh, really rather a different way of looking at cities, cities being not so much as machines, but cities as organisms, which actually grew and evolved from the bottom up in that sense. And at the same time, uh, as the development of, um, uh, of uh, complexity theory in this particular context, the notion that there might be more than one model came onto the agenda. So multiple perspectives and multiple theories to some extent. And this really relates to this notion that as cities uh, evolve and grow in time, uh, the at the present time, basically, they're becoming more complex in some sense. I want to also make the distinction in this between what I call the high frequency and the low frequency city. There's actually a, a massive confusion in the modern day about what cities actually are. There's, if you go back 50 years or more, then most people talking about cities were really talking about, at least talking about cities in terms of their urban planning, that is, uh, we're really talking about how cities 
changed or could be changed and could be planned over the relatively long term. The notion of thinking about cities in the very short term, what's happening in the next five seconds or the next five minutes and so on, is something that really has come onto the agenda through um, the, the ability to embed computers into cities and to actually sense things. And so the notion of um, uh, cities, the high frequency of the city, uh, uh, being me measured in some sense and sensed in some way, um, is really part and parcel of the development of computation, which really al runs alongside the development of complexity theory in that sense. So, so the fact that we now have more than one model is as much due to the fact that um, we have computers that are able to handle uh, different models, and we have many people who are skilled enough to be able to do things about that, to handle different models, um, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, to, to develop their own perspectives, their own models, if you like, on the same thing. And this is really all to do with the emergence of the smart city. I tend to make this distinction quite uh, significant, quite to, uh, to make the, the difference between high and low frequency quite a distinct part of my own thinking in this sense. And that's largely due to the fact that I was originally trained in the sort of low frequency city, how we made plans for, you know, 10 years or 20 years or 50 years and so on. In that sense, rather than in operations research um, and um, in uh, computer engineering and so on, which is perhaps more concerned uh, with the development of the smart city in that sense, and certainly concerned with the development of uh, large streams of data, big data in this particular context. So an excellent example of the sort of complexity that we now face, I'm just going to show you a couple of pictures, rail networks in London, for example. So rail networks in Manhattan, of course, are equally complex. And if you go to uh, Tokyo, um, uh, you see even more complicated things, but effectively, this is a this is a map of more or less central central or inner London, one might say, uh, and embedded within this map, these are all railways basically. Some of them are well, they're all the same gauge basically because our tube system is the same gauge as the uh, uh, as the uh, network rail basically, the intercity rail or um, suburban rail and so on, which we call network rail in Britain, but the underground or basically the, the, the subway system is buried in there. The, the, usually you see the map of the subway system as this highly idealized 1920s, 1930s Beck map, supposedly in that sense. And you have a variant of that, of course, in Manhattan. Um, one of the features is that if you go to Tokyo, you actually look at the subway maps or the railways maps, and they're more like this particular map where all the railways have been put on top of one another. And so in some sense, the, the, the picture in Tokyo is no less, no more complex really than what it is in London. Although, because we're used to the sort of abstracted Beck map, uh, then we tend to think of it uh, in a little bit, uh, a slightly different way. Um, the same is true, I think, of, of Manhattan, and the same is probably true of Paris uh, in that sense, that all big cities have this kind of complexity. Now, of course, in some senses, the, the idea of transit, modeling transit and changes in time is going to be one of my models uh, that I'll show you in a moment, one of my twins, if you like, in that sense of how the city works. Um, these sorts of things are just one slice through the city itself, the sheer complexity, uh, we're just looking here at uh, rail networks, but put the, put the bus network on top of that, put, put the walking network, put the biking network on top, and we're still dealing with the physical movement of people. Once we add, begin to uh, add materials in this sense, and certainly once we move into the information context, then uh, the networks in fact are uh, increasingly complex to actually unravel. So here are some networks in a sense that uh, well, London is in this somewhere, for example, there's a Facebook traces network uh, and then tweets network, Flickr networks and so on, uh, really relating to where tweets emanate from, tweets across Europe in this sense, uh, a Flickr network, photographs in, uh, in London basically, all showing you where people have located and where they've been sending messages. And then of course we have email, and then on the immediate right hand side there's a night lights photograph of Tokyo, and then the tube uh, flows which I'll talk about, and then uh, retail locations almost as a network of uh, 
uh, of, of retailing basically in London in the bottom right hand corner. So I could actually spend the rest of the lecture just throwing pictures of networks and different types of uh, information, energy, physical movement and so on. And this is the kind of thing we really have to get to grips with. And of course, because we have so many of these different layers of data now, it's not surprising that we actually articulate, we try to simplify and we develop different models um, of different uh, uh, different networks in that sense. Putting them together is the big question really in a sense. And that's the big uh, question mark that I will kind of leave you with once we develop some of these ideas. Okay, so many models of the same phenomena. This is not something that is particularly new in some sense that so you can go back a long time. And when people first began to talk about models in the 1950s and 60s, prior to that time, uh, the term model was not used much at all in science, basically. And I suppose to some extent you could say that the term model, in fact, has uh, emerged and been derived through uh, the development of computers over this last 80 years or so. But basically, um, almost at the very beginning, people began to think about possibly more than one model of the same thing. The world was much smaller, you know, 50 to 80 years or so ago in the middle of the 20th century, uh, in that sense, and there were less people working on these things. But there was still this notion that um, you may be able to develop a good model, uh, a plausible model of a phenomenon uh, and there might be more than one plausible model of the same phenomenon. They would be different in that sense. There's a great book by Greenberger, Martin Greenberger, Crenson and Crilly uh, called uh, Models in the Policy Process. Uh, I think those guys were in New York, basically, in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, and it's by Russell Sage Foundation, that book. And they talk about the idea of counter modeling in that sense. And they also uh, introduced the idea that uh, in, in economic forecasting, and to a limited extent, even back then in weather forecasting, uh, there may be more than one model. And the ult ultimately, of course, in terms of financial forecasting, you know, the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England and so on run their, uh, run their models, many models from different groups, and pool the resources uh, on a, um, a monthly or quarterly basis in this particular context. And many of those fields, in fact, are very used to the idea there might be more than one model. It's a very good book by uh, Scott Page uh, called The Model Thinker, where he argues this great. Lots of people have written about uh, plural modeling in that sense, Dirk Helbing from ETH and so on. A variety of people have written about this. And this, of course, uh, begins to resonate very strongly with the idea of digital twins. So the big question then is, is it more than what all are plausible? How do, we, how do we use them? How do we integrate them? How close are they to the real thing? And I'm not going to answer this question, but I would simply want to pose it uh, for discussion in a sense that different models can be validated uh, in different ways and they can still pertain to different perspectives on the same thing. So how do we keep all of these perspectives in our mind in this particular context? Now, some of these questions are uh, push us into the realms of philosophy and theory to some extent in, in some sense. And they also begin to question, if you like, and I'm not going to look at this in any detail. I do look at it a little bit in my Inventing Future Cities book, but uh, in some senses, a lot of these ideas really relate to this notion about the extent to which we can predict the future or the extent to which our models may be able to help us explore the future uh, and inform in terms of the future in this particular way. Okay, so let's move on to this idea of digital twins. What are they from? Um, now, in some senses, uh, in an audience like this, everybody say, well, well, clearly what you're talking about here is a model, and models are abstractions, they're simplifications of the real thing, um, and uh, we can clearly have more than one model in that sense, they're different types of abstraction and simplification in the sense. So how can we think of them in any sense as being twins? This is a slightly weird uh, use of the term uh, of the terminology in a sense. Of course, one of the things about models is that we throw away a lot more than we actually keep. In fact, most of the real world that we observe, um, which is relevant to our models, uh, is not captured by our models in that sense. And very often the best models are the simplest. Uh, and in that sense, that conflicts directly uh, against this notion that the model is close and getting closer to the real thing, which is really to some extent what the digital twin is all about in a sense. 
So it's this tension between simplification and reality, which of course has always been there in a sense, but it's particularly evident when we have uh, computers to uh, enable us and theories and data and so on to enable us to uh, look at more than one model in that sense. And they begin to make comparisons in a sense. Now, this is my, this is the best example I've got of a digital twin. It's actually taken from a book by Gordon Pask, who is one of the, uh, one of the founders, along with Norbert Weiner and uh, Ross Ashby and so on, of cybernetics, wrote a little book in 1961, sort of British, British version of these things, uh, called An Approach to Cybernetics. And this is an excellent example, in my view, of, of what a digital twin is. So the real thing, it's also a good example of what a black box is. So in the black box, or in the boxes, basically, is a traffic system, basically, uh, in PASC's um, terminology. So this is, our, this is our real system, basically, the little boxes with the flows between them. And that's what we're observing and trying to figure out. Um, and clearly, we have a variety of sensors, uh, uh, or, 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 or uh, links, as it were, uh, from uh, the model, the digital twin. The digital twin is the sort of little kind of bent screen, basically, in this, which is linked directly to sensing the real thing itself. So in that sense, you could think of it perhaps even as a controller in some sense, but it is a model uh, of the thing. It's not the thing itself that you can clearly see. Um, and the important thing in this context is that there's, there's a bunch of people, a bunch of uh, uh, scientists, if you like, or nerds or whoever, basically watching uh, the digital twin, basically, which in turn is monitoring the, the real system. And that's very important because the human in the loop is all important in terms of our thinking about models, essentially. So uh, if you have a look at uh, Gordon Pask's book, I think is online somewhere, basically, but he has some very nice look like this, which illustrate different aspects of models. So let me abstract from that. So we have the real system and we have the digital twin. So let's assume we have one twin and it's close in some sense to uh, the real system. And one of the, one of the definitions of a digital twin is that it relates directly to the real system. Now think about that, that relating directly to the real system, you may have a digital twin or you may have a model that does not relate directly um, to the real system. It must, it must relate indirectly because otherwise, why would you even be building the model basically in a sense? But in terms of digital twin, uh, the definition often is that the digital twin exchanges information uh, with the system. And so in terms of our previous uh, Gordon Pass diagram, basically the interchange of information um, is, is contained through the, the sensors, the wires, the communication, uh, in this particular context. So uh, let's look at the uh, at this notion of the of the digital twin. Now, into this particular context, we have the humans in the loop. And that's all important because that changes the nature of the relationship between the model, which is the digital twin in this sense, and the real system in some sense. That in a way, if we didn't have the human in the loop, it would be an entirely automated system that would uh, function by itself. Now, we may have more than one digital twin. We may have lots of models in this context. So the, the, the issues in all of this are to deal with this and to look at different examples and to actually enable us to proceed uh, with a world that is really composed of many models, et cetera. And of course, we could argue many systems in this particular context and indeed uh, many humans dealing with it. How do we integrate them? There are multiple ways of doing this in a sense. In fact, this is an excellent picture too uh, in some sense of a digital twin. This is a picture of the ENIAC, the, um, the computer that uh, uh, various people think in the University of Pennsylvania worked on at the end of the war, uh, and von Neumann worked on it in basically, and this is taken from the book by uh, Bhattacharya, uh, which is the man from the future, because the man from the future was John von Neumann basically, but what, what this picture is, is of an early version of the ENIAC where the, the, the human was not just in the loop in the sense I said, but was actually inside of the computer. Um, Harry Reid, a mathematician who joined the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the project, uh, which was moved, I think, from uh, University of Pennsylvania to uh, the Institute of Advanced Study by von Neumann in 1950. Um, he said that now we think of a personal computer as one that you can carry around with you in this sense. The ENIAC was one that you actually 
kind of lived inside in some sense in that way. And maybe we're moving back to the central circle. The idea of the metaverse and so on, which is very current in many ways, is really uh, a notion of, the, of this particular context. Okay, so what we're really saying is that can, or, or, or what we're posing is the problem of can the digital twin be a mirror image? It may be a replica, but it can't be the same as the original because otherwise it would be the original in this sense. And this is in this, in this extent, we assume it's a simulation. Now, there are a number of features um, of digital twins or models, I should say, that really we need to think about. First of all, models depend on their media. And if the media, to some extent, or their physicality in that sense, is um, is similar to the original uh, system, etc. And then we may think of it as being a twin in that sense. And if, for example, the uh, the real system is a digital system of some sort, then another digital system running alongside it and related to it uh, is something that could be quite close to the original. Uh, to, to, the, to, to the, the real system, which is digital in that sense. So in some sense, the media is all important. If the media is very different between the model and the real thing in some sense, then there really is little chance of the two actually beginning to merge in that sense. The second point is that uh, can a digital twin be used for predicting a future in some sense? A lot of the examples of where people are talking about digital twins are really controllers in some sense. They control the future rather than predict the future in that sense. So this is another conundrum, this notion of whether a digital twin is a predictor in some sense. The third feature is digital twins are reactive, not predictive. That's really based on this notion that to what extent can we actually predict the future in some sense. The fourth point is that a digital twin is a coupling. This is what I illustrated before in terms of the Gordon Pass diagram, a, a transfer of information uh, between the original system and the digital system. And many of our models only in the very loosest sense transfer information in that particular context. The very fact that we're modeling the world in a sense is it does involve a transfer of information to some extent between our science and the, uh, and, and the real system itself. And last but not least, there's a sense in which the digital twin might be used indeed as a controller. So all of these things are really important in terms of the digital twin. So where do digital twins come from? Well, it appears that uh, the term was first suggested by Michael Greaves in uh, the early 2000s, who wrote a couple of papers. There is a paper in the archive. Uh, I think, um, which is Greaves' original paper basically now. But um, it's like many of these things, it was suggested in production engineering. And you can see why in that automated context, um, uh, that uh, you can see why in that automated context that the idea of a model that is close, uh, a model of the automation in some sense, um, is, really, uh, it, it is really key to this. Now, the closest in our world, or rather I should say my world, is um, which is the world really of cities viewed from the perspective of um, uh, the physicality of buildings and so on, architecture in this particular context, uh, and also to some extent, um, uh, the social context of cities as well, the social science context. The closest in our world to um, the idea of a digital twin is a BIM, basically. And I've already said this a moment ago, that uh, buildings, utilities, physical infrastructures, basically, we can actually build models of not only how they're designed and constructed, but how they the same model can be used in terms of their maintenance. So it's a continuing thing. And in that context, you can think of certain types of uh, computer-aided design, computer-aided manufacture, and so on, uh, relating to buildings in this sense as being digital twins in this particular way. Okay, now let me digress for five minutes um, and talk a little bit about some interesting analogies in some sense between uh, real systems and abstract systems in this sense. That, and the, the most evocative of, of these metaphors really relate to maps because maps are simplifications. And there are many, many stories about how the, uh, the idea of a map is very problematic. People here would may know about Benoit Mandelbrot, who's the inventor of fractals, um, famous paper, How Long is the Coastline of Britain? which was published in Science in 1967. Of course, the answer is that the coastline in terms of certain scales is, is infinite, et cetera, but the real answer is 
it actually depends in that sense. Now, the best digital twin story I've ever heard is the one that is taken from Lewis Carroll's book, Sylvie and Bruno Concluded. That's his last book. Lewis Carroll, of course, is the person who uh, wrote about um, Alice in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass and so on uh, in this particular context, which, uh, which are books from the uh, 19th century that are full of uh, different sorts of metaphors, full of different insights into the world itself. They may appear to be sort of childhood books in some sense, but there is much more to it in that sense. So in his last book, Sylvie Bruno, Bruno concluded, uh, Carol tells the, the story about a conversation between himself and a German gentleman about making a map close to the real thing. Now, let me uh, at the risk of, uh, of staying my welcome, read it out to you. Um, I'm afraid I, I should be able to read uh, the German gentleman's uh, uh, phrases in, in a Germanic accent, but I'm not very good at Germanic accent. But so, so me and uh, mein Herr, basically, uh, are the, the Englishman and the, uh, and, and the German, basically. So I begin by saying, what a useful thing a pocket map is, I remarked, mein Herr. That's another thing we've learned from your nation, said mine here. Map making, and we've carried it much further than you. What do you consider the largest map that would be really useful to myself? About six inches to the mile, mine here. Only six inches, explained my hair. We very soon got to six yards to the mile. Then we tried a hundred yards to the mile, and then came the greatest idea of all. We actually made a map of the country on the scale of a mile to a mile, myself. Have you used it much? I inquired. Mine hair. It's never been spread out yet, said mine hair. The farmers objected. They said it would cover the whole country and shut out the sunlight. So now we use the country itself as its own map. And I assure you, it nearly does as well. So Carol, of course, wrote this in uh, 1893. And it really relates to this whole notion of how close can you get to the real thing. Now, lots of other people, um, Borges, uh, Gregory Bateson, Joan Robinson, the economist, uh, 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 Baudrillard, John Baudrillard, David Galanta, even D.H. Lawrence said that the map appears to us more real than the land itself. He said that in one of his novels in, in 1925. Borges has a very good essay on this called On Exactitude in Science. He more or less tells the same story that uh, Lewis Carroll uh, told about uh, cartographers uh, obsessed with their art, but he talks it, it, in terms of uh, a fictional empire where they were making a map of, of one to one, but the next generations uh, were not as enamored of cartography and they basically had little use for the map. And he concludes by saying that in the deserts of the West still today, there are tattered ruins of that map. And that evokes to me uh, what you see in a, in a movie like The English Patient or the book by the uh, uh, on The English Patient, which is really, this is Ralph Fiennes basically with uh, his clutching his book in the Western Desert in the Second World War, Herodotus, the history is basically in that sense. And in some senses, these represent the remnants of the map, basically, in that sense. You can think of that in terms of this particular movie. And of course, in a way, um, you know, will, uh, uh, will the fate of the digital twin be the same as uh, uh, in the case of Borges' essay, basically, will it be tattered ruins in the Western desert, basically, in that sense. So what, what is the fate of the digital twin? How long will it last in our vocabulary in terms of thinking about models um, and abstractions and science in that sense? Now, the last thing I want to do, I'm conscious of time here, that I've got about another uh, 10 or 15 minutes, and we'll look at some examples in a moment. But I just wanted to say that um, quite independently, back in 1974, my colleague, uh, Lionel March, who, who passed away a couple of years ago, he basically uh, also introduced Lewis Carroll in, in a paper to the Urban Development Models Conference at Churchill College, Cambridge uh, in 1974. Now, I'm not going to, uh, and you can't read this basically, but I'm not going to uh, did say, um, and this is really to, uh, to, uh, to, to summarise in a sense uh, what I've been talking about in the last five minutes, uh, Lionel said, all models to be useful must be selective, and if you like, false to the reality in some respect or another. Pocket models may be the most useful in the end. And I want to note here George Box's hallowed phrase. George Box was an English statistician. I don't think he's alive still, but English statistician who wrote uh, a lot about response surfaces and so on. Uh, George Box, his hallowed phrase was, um, 
all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, and that really is to some extent the watchword in terms of what we're talking about uh, this afternoon. Okay, now let me move on to some, uh, some models of twins in that sense. Most of what I've been talking about is preamble, it's discussion, it's about uh, the issues in a sense. But uh, we, um, uh, and we never really planned it this way, uh, in our group in, in London, we have a variety of different models. And it, it turns out uh, that because our models are um, of different kinds, built by different people, uh, we've never really considered them as being uh, models of the same place. But even a model of the UK um, has all places in that sense. And if we have a model even of, um, let's say, the Olympic Park, for example, and this is going to be our, our, our example, our focus, a model of the Olympic Park, uh, also a model of the UK and traffic flow in the UK basically covers the Olympic Park in that sense. So we, we have models that really pertain to one particular place. So if you extract the place and look at the different models, what can we actually say about the place? Now, of course, in one sense, most of these models have been built by uh, different people uh, who have a different perspective and a different problem in some sense. So the issue, of course, is that uh, we're talking about four problems in a particular place, in a sense, although, interestingly enough, uh, the sufficient synergy between the different groups, basically, for them to be able to think of their models as interacting with other models. So these four models are in integrated in some sense. OK, so uh, uh, you'll, you'll see the, the context as we actually go along. Let's begin with the, 3D cities, basically, which I mentioned earlier on were models really uh, which uh, lots of uh, people in the popular uh, conception of what, uh, uh, what cities are about really think about computers and cities in this sense. Uh, Andy Hudson-Smith and myself um, in Casa Rota, we, we did a lot of work actually some 20 years ago thinking about the development of 3D models. And here's a paper from Architectural Design. And you can see that um, uh, we developed these various models for, uh, for London, basically. Uh, and this was... And the, um, and the data, the LIDAR data that could, we could enable to actually build our 3D model had become available in such a way and we could, we could build them relatively quickly in this particular context. Uh, here, for example, I'll just, uh, I'll just, uh, the, 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 there's little movies in the background here. Basically, this was our model from 2003 or 4, uh, basically, and we're interested here in, um, it's a block model, basically. We're not really interested in the rendering uh, of the buildings we're flying along the Thames here basically and you can sort of see uh, well it's a block model in that sense there's a building there that's renovated a bit a Cannon Street station we're onto the South Bank there and you can see classically we're interested in building a model which is really like a 3D filing cabinet for things like um, uh, the attributes of these different buildings uh, as we pan around across Parliament there you can actually see the um, uh, the Millennium Wheel that Andy himself painstakingly digitized. So about 50 buildings in about um, uh, three or 4,000 building blocks, basically, um, which have been rendered in more detail. But the model, in fact, extends across to Greater London with about three, 3 million building blocks in, in that sense. So these are very typical of 3D models. They're very routine now. In the top right-hand corner, um, were I to run that, um, a YouTube movie, I think, or maybe Vimeo or, or, or YouTube, you would get the Skidmore, Owings and Merrill models, which were built uh, by, the, uh, by that architectural company uh, back in the early 80s, that uh, by the early 80s, we got to the point where you could build wireframe models very easily. So to some extent, these are our, these are our first models. And uh, Andy Hudson-Smith has continued with this sort of thing uh, in some sense. Here's his more recent uh, models, which is much more to do with importing different uh, visualizations into each other in some sense. So in a way, it's building a model and importing it into itself really recursively in this context and setting it up into uh, these virtual environments. So to some extent, insofar as one can articulate the metaverse really, to some extent, a lot of these 3D models have come into this particular context. Professor so Barry, we have five minutes. Five minutes. OK, very good. So I, I can race through this because it's sort of mainly visual, basically. So so let's move on. Um, and you can see there's pictures here of, of Andy's metaverse, basically, uh, where he has his model 
um, imported into probably Unity or one of the 3D environments. And um, uh, uh, real-time data, tube trains and so on, are linked in, in that sense. This looks like a sort of constructor set in some sense, but uh, um, it looks like a, a, a physical toy model in that particular context, but I assure you that it's, it's entirely digital in this particular way. Okay, now, um, the, so, so the first models are 3D and they cover basically this area of uh, which we call, uh, we call East London, which is uh, the Olympic Stadium, basically, in that sense. So, uh, so this is the building that was the media centre of the Olympics in 2012 uh, and was then taken over. It wasn't built, uh, you, it was obviously built using various sort of software, but the integrated BIM basically has been constructed after the event. This building is being wired or has been wired by a group in our, 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 our um, connected environments group. Um, uh, and they have a whole variety of different software that you're seeing, which is a, a 3D version of the building itself. Uh, the building being monitored in real time. So a lot of these real time sensing techniques um, are taken account of in terms of uh, uh, in terms of the, the structure of the building itself. This is a little bit like those men in the Gordon Pass thing looking at the, um, the, 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 their interface basically, in a sense, and, and making sense of the buildings. And here, here are some pictures of the, of the software and so on. So a lot of this work is associated with energy monitoring, uh, mon monitoring movements and so on in the building. But of course you could extend this to the actual reconstruction of the building, the renewal of the building in that sense. Right now, my um, uh, my second, my third example. Basically, we looked at three D cities. We've looked at uh, a BIM in that sense. My my third example is the the our, our transit data. You can see here that uh, uh, London uh, for twenty years now has had a an automated payment system, basically, which is transit, and it gives us a, a really very good data, basically, in that sense for um, uh, the demand for uh, travel. Basically, you have to tap in and tap out. Uh, in that sense. And so this is the network again that we've got. Uh, and this is the kind of data we can do that I just uh, click this working. And you can probably see if you look at the top right hand corner, the little CASA thing in the top right hand corner uh, of the screen there, basically, you can actually see that we're on Tuesday. And that's the morning peak on Tuesday. That's the evening peak coming up and then the late night sort of entertainment peak. And then we're into Wednesday, Wednesday morning, um, and then Wednesday uh, evening peak and so on. So this is the blood flow map. This is the energy map. This is the complexity, really, in a sense. Uh, as John Reeds, who, who worked on that, there is a YouTube mu movie, Oyster Gives a Bit Pearls, basically, in this sense. And what we've been interested in doing here is linking it to the real-time trains. We've not only got, um, and I'll put, I'll put them both working, we've got the real-time trains data uh, on Trackernet, basically, at the bottom, and we've got the real-time uh, flow data from demand. So if you like, the top map represents demand and the bottom map represents supply of trains. We want to link them together. We can't do that because basically in the tube, you're not allowed to track people, even Transport for London. They do track people. In fact, they've got a lot of camera stuff and so on gear to track stuff. Uh, but there are all sorts of bylaws related to confidentiality in that sense. So the idea is that we can put demand and supply together in this particular context. And this indeed does cover the Olympic Park. Um, uh, above the clock on this thing, you can see the loop, basically. The Olympic Park is very close to this. And one of the important things in the Olympic Park uh, where we have the here east building and so on is that we have a new high-speed railway being built called crossrail uh, which links um, right across the capital basically uh, and uh, one of the kind of key points is at stratford on the olympic park so okay so that's but all this is very typical of transit data now i want to show you this picture right i've got to show you this picture this is big data in 1939 these are ladies working for london transport London Underground, they're counting tubes tickets, they're doing an origin and destination survey, um, counting these tube, tube tickets for where people uh, started their journey and finished their journey. Uh, I always like to think of this, this is almost before computers were invented, right? They were invented in 37, 38, 39 in the US, the UK and Germany simultaneously. Um, this is in 1939, it's four months before war broke out in Europe. Let's not talk about war in Europe so, uh, in, uh, today, but, uh, but nevertheless, that this is, 
Very interesting that this was going on. There's really nothing new under the sun. Okay, my last example, and I'm going to run through this very quickly, is a land use transportation model of the UK. We've scaled our models up uh, to the UK, basically. So this is London, and uh, you can see that I'm just going through the desktop model here, basically. The little um, blue dot is the Olympic Park. So our model covers, all of the models cover the Olympic Park in that sense. We scaled it up. This is England and Wales, the uh, zoning system. We scaled up our model. It's web-based. It's called Quant in that sense. Um, and uh, we've scaled it up. And basically, of course, within this scaling up of the model, that's looking at Merseyside, basically. But so um, let me just go back. So in other words, in this model in the London area, we have the Olympic Park. And of course, a lot of what we're able to do in the model really relates to the very hot area for development, the Olympic Park, basically. And you can see these are slides that really are taken from um, the development of this new high speed rail, uh, cross rail, which is that blue line, more or less, uh, across uh, London. And you can see um, in the middle of the picture here, basically, you can see uh, those histograms basically uh, on D there basically represent activity in the Olympic Park. So to some extent, we have these models at this particular point. And the big question mark is how do we relate them? How do we put them together within a context that uh, enables us to make feedbacks between them? And because, because they've been built from groups, basically, or different groups who have the same ideologies in some respect and same technical expertise, uh, but a slightly different problem context, then there are some big questions about um, should we put them together at all or should or, or should we simply accept the fact that um, different people coming to these, these sort of problems will develop different models. Okay, now um, I'm a, a couple of minutes over. Let me just make three points to begin with. I, I, I leave you to judge, as it were, whether or not the idea of the digital twin or the many model thing is a useful thing. Uh, yes and no, it forces us to think about how cities are changing, how models are proliferating, how do we deal with many models of the same thing, federated digital twins and so on um, are on the horizon and so on. Many it, it, it leads us to think about the language itself of digital twins, if we have digital twins, what about triplets, quadruplets and so on. And so, you know, the mind actually is stretched a little bit by all of this. And so it also enables us to think about what smart cities are. It enables us to think more broadly about the low frequency and the high frequency city in this sense. Uh, and indeed how cities are being transformed by new technologies, um, new technologies that enable us to learn about cities and also do something about them in terms of their planning. And it forces us to think, I suppose, about what a model really is and how we can link many models together and how we can think about many models and different conceptions of the system at the same time. Now, at that point, I want to finish. Um, thanks for listening. Um, there's the uh, link to the PowerPoint or the PDF, basically, 2P8F8ERM. Basically, that should get you there. You never quite know about this. I've written some editorials in the journal Environment Planning B, which I edit. Um, and um, as you can see, these are short editorials. That, um, they're open access, basically. Digital Twins, a map is not the territory, is it? That's the um, Sylvia and Bruno concluded uh, thing with Lewis Carroll. And then multiple models. Uh, a recent one. And then we, put, we have a, um, a paper which is being revised at the moment in a book called Digital Twins for Smart Cities by Lee Wan and various people over at Cambridge. Um, and, and what I've contained in terms of the examples are contained in that particular book. Uh, and last but not least, um, I want to, I'd like to refer you to mainly the Urban Informatics book, which is edited by myself, by John Shi, Mike Goodchild, myself, Maypo Kwan, and Nanshu Zhang. And it's open access, you can download it um, um, it's got lots of things about sensing and smart cities and some of the things that I've talked briefly about. So at that point, Shara, I will stop and hand back to you. And if we have any time for questions, then I'd be very pleased to answer it. So I've stopped uh, sharing, I think. Yes. Thank um, you, Professor Badi, for um, the very insightful uh, presentation. Let's give a round of applause to the speaker. Um, so we have 10 minutes 
for questions, you can either raise your hand or uh, I think it's easier because I see that we have many participants. Uh, just unmute yourself and ask or put your question in the chat, whatever, whatever feels most comfortable. And I can, oh, is there a question? Oh. Yeah, on the cost of them as I am to public speaking, as they say. Michael, uh, so Yuri Paris, Jack here. Yes, yeah, no, I can see you. I've seen you in the chat, Yuri, yeah. Yeah, so one question, we had a real hard time with IBM, with smart cities, and that was, to make them smart, you have to bring all kinds of components together in one place. And they never came together in one place until it was like too far up the management chain. I mean, has that issue been resolved? And I know you guys did some really good work with Imperial as well on with London. What have you found that can fix that problem? Well, I, I, I think a lot of these issues are to some extent managed. Well, I, I think every aspect of the problem has issues that we one needs to deal with and we've not dealt with them. So for example, organization, I think is very important as you said, you, uh, as you go up the management chain, basically, you get too far up and you're not able to do... Um, I think there's an organisational issue in terms of smart cities. I think there's also confusion about what um, is needed in terms of making cities smart. I mean, the very term smart city is problematic in that sense, that um, a lot of technologies, I think, which are introduced into cities are fairly obvious to some extent and, and very basic. And I think there is this issue about our inability to actually connect up basically in a sense, in a way. So I think all of these problems really plague cities. That If cities are ever increasingly complex systems, then you can begin to see how difficult it is to begin to put things together basically in that sense. Um, the real horror stories, I think, we've not really recounted yet, in a sense, that the, the top-down smart cities that are developed in the Middle East and so on, and Korea and so on, I think those real, the real issues were, it's just a complete digression from what's actually happening. You know, if we ask the question, what, what is a smart city, then um, it's no good going to Mazda or or any like that, you've got to really look at existing cities because our existing cities are full of people, you know, taking decisions about what's needed and so on. Uh, and in some sense, you know, they're all, they, 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 they obviously, you know, want to make their cities more efficient, more equitable, smarter in this particular context. So it's a very big question, um, uh, Yuri, in that sense, very big question. Thank you. Uh, I see uh, Professor Juan Bello has uh, his hand raised. Yeah, thank you so much for the for the great talk. Uh, lots of points to discuss here. I just wanted to pick up on a couple of things that you say. So one was this notion that uh, for the digital twin, really as a couple uh, element to the real system, right? So the interaction in between the two that that the digital twin itself can influence the real system, right? And the other thing that you mentioned is this notion of uh, the models needing to be selective somehow, right? They cannot be comprehensive. There has to be a selection. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering about the interaction between these two things. You know, what in the selection or what the model contains shapes the way that, you know, we act on real systems, you know, mediated by the digital twin. And, you know, like, like how, you know, how well studied is that? You know, I just want to sort of like get your thoughts as to the issues or opportunities of that. Um, yeah, in the context of, 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 you know, these multiple systems and these multiple decision-making yeah. processes around these systems. You see, I think that if you go back, you know, 50 or more years to, to let's say, the 50s and the 60s, there was this notion that we should develop comprehensive models of the cities. Now, of course, comprehensive in those days was very different from what we might think of as all embracing or comprehensive now that you know things like climate issues and so on energy and so on were not really talked about in any sense but nevertheless there's this notion that we should sort of try and cover everything because the city acted as a kind of integrated whole and i think that view has been dramatically eroded 
as cities have become more complex, as we've had more experiences of how they change. And, and that's one of the reasons why we, why people build different models um, uh, of the same thing over and over again. You can point to some examples where you have a history of a similar model, but not the same because it's built by different people being built over many years. In fact, most big cities, New York, for example, if you were to recount the number of models that have been built you know, over the last 50 to 60 or 70 years, basically, in that sense, and looked at them in that sense, one would be, one would find that the, the examples of those models were simply a catalogue of different approaches, really, in some senses, um, emphasising different things at different times. Now, the big question is, can we move beyond that? It's back to uh, Yuri's question again, in a bit, in a way, you know, can we actually put these things together in a particular fashion that they don't fight against each other and that they add synergy to each other in that sense. So, so it's a very difficult question. The other, the other aspect of the question you raise, I think, is that um, different people are, are, respond to problems uh, a little differently and their models, and it depends, of course, on uh, whether they are responsible for building the model or initiating it in some sense, but 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 lots of different groups of people will pick different models, some of them off the shelf, some, some purpose built and so on, um, uh, and that they'll be reflected, what they model will be reflected in what they're interested in. And the other feature, of course, is that the limits that we have over developing a model um, might actually show up in the way the problem is articulated. A lot of the early land use um, transport models in the 1960s in the United States uh, really were great for looking at uh, uh, the highway systems and so on, but they really didn't address any of the kind of key problems that were dominating the city. So in fact, there's enormous mismatch between, you know, what the model was designed to do. It was designed to do some things that were relevant in cities, but most things that were going on in cities were not really modelled in that sense. So, um, uh, so I think there's a lot of issues involved in that sense. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Badi. We have another one minute if someone wants to jump in with a very quick question. Um, I guess my very quick question would be, um, if you could, in a in a in a short phrase, sort of uh, see whether digital twins uh, can help us uh, answer some of the grand challenges that you mentioned in uh, in the replies to the previous two questions that arise either from integrating local priorities or from answering questions at the scale of cities and states like uh, emissions reduction? Yeah, um, well, of course, I think that um, there is a coincidence of interest here in the sense that we talk now um, in terms of cities about many of the grand challenges. Typically, I'm sure they're the same in the States as in, in the UK. They're international in that sense, clearly climate change, the quest for net zero, uh, the whole question about pollution, fossil fuels, and so on, aging, etc., migration, these big waves of change that are dominating the planet, really, in a sense, uh, and how cities relate to them. Cities have become very focal within this debate because, you know, to some extent, the power um, uh, ra uh, lies in the cities of doing things about it, uh, doing things about some of these grand challenges and so on. Um, and your question is, how can digital twins enable us to uh, think about those issues? Well, of course, one of, the, one of the great problems is how we integrate these very different perspectives. And to some extent, the digital twin is the notion that we might have different models for different aspects of these grand challenges. Um, the notion of actually putting together digital twins, which I suppose was the question I posed but never answered, how do we put these things together? The, 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 it may well be that um, if we work on that sort of problem, that enables us to think about how we can actually link some of the 
uh, some of the issues that the model or the digital twin would relate to in that sense. Um, and that really is casting the problem, not so much in terms of digital twins, but the kind of tools, techniques and theories and ideas and so on that we actually need to actually broach the problems in the first place, basically. I think there are plenty of models of climate change, um, uh, for, uh, weather forecasting and so on, uh, which um, uh, generate different sorts of models that where we do have some way of thinking about how to integrate them in that sense. So maybe the challenge lies, lies in that. I think one of the big issues there is that um, uh, as soon as we pose these grand challenges, then the, although they are grand challenges as such, they're, they're not easy to relate. They're, they're different perspectives on the kind of complexity that we face at so it's much easier to sort of separate them off from each other uh, in some sense and not integrate them in that way. So I think the, one of the big quests is to think about integration and maybe digital, well, the idea of many models in this context rather than digital twins, I think. I mean, digital twins is the, is the hot phrase basically, but the idea of many models, I think, is, um, uh, is something that's really quite important to thinking about how we articulate some of those grand challenges, really. Thank you. And the presentation was also a great walk through different disciplines. We saw economists, engineers, mathematicians. So this really speaks to the interdisciplinarity of the challenge. Uh, with that, I would like to thank the speaker. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. And um, our next seminar uh, will, uh, in our next seminar, uh, we will host Dr. Mona Sloan from the Institute of Public Knowledge, who will um, talk about uh, AI, enabling AI and ethical AI. Thank you again, Professor Badi. Thank you again, everyone, for joining. Have a good weekend. Thank you so much. Paul, uh, I'm, just, I'm just greeting some of my friends here. Paul, nice <laughs> to see you in the corner there. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I had a question for you, Professor Badi. You, you talked a lot about the work of Andy Hudson Smith, but you, you must be aware of much better work than Andy's work. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Actually, he's doing all right. The oh, metaverse, very well. saved him. metaverse has saved him. Yeah. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Yeah, thanks very much. Bye. Then. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you for listening. So, how are things, Mike?